Well, uh, we're getting close to the weekend and we're right here with a breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Time for us to look at the pages. We call it Off the Press. The Punch is here. We have all the papers we're looking through it and we're being joined by our guests uh, from Akwaibom State, Zikang Yaitok. Obong Otuekong, it's good to have you join us. Good morning. All right, so uh, if you can hear me, you need to unmute your device, and that's it. Uh, Kofi has also joined us this morning, unfortunately. You know what it feels okay. like to be in Lagos. Uh, Otuwe Kong, it's good to have you join us. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Always a pleasure. God bless you. All right, then we'll start off the uh, papers this morning with the punch. Uh, looking at the punch, recent crisis aimed at stopping me. That's what Tunubu is saying. Says Naira redesigned fuel scarcity designed to squatter poor. Tunubu trying to blackmail Buhari. A Tiku campaign is quoted to say allegations are unfair and fuel crisis. Uh, it's a perennial issue, says marketers. Okay. Federal government budgets 1.2 trillion Naira to service CBN loans. Banks ration new notes. MFE Sean's reps. Voting, Atiku, will be a mistake, says Whistleblower. And still looking at the punch now, and it says, duty hike, used vehicles import fall by 40%. Uh, Just before we move away from the punch now, suspense as tribunal decides a delicate Oyetala suit on Friday. Ikpeazu Ohaneze Mwan, Abia PDP governor candidate. Uh, we ask that his soul rest in peace. Parties back U.S. visa ban on elections. Regas, these are the headlines you find this morning on the Punch newspaper. Uh, very interesting headlines indeed on the Punch. The nation has the following headlines. We go through them quickly. The big one there, Tinubu, fifth columnist behind Petro scarcity, Naira redesign row. Uh, the, the plots to embarrass Buhari's cattle elections. Uh, I'll look at it a bit of it before we are done today. Um, how Africa can banish food insecurity by Buhari. Uh, bomb blast kills 51 in Nasarawa. Victims get mass burial. It is a heartbreaking story. More from the nation. Impeachment. A kitty court orders parties to file processes. This is an interesting one to keep an eye on. U.S. slams visa ban on enemies of democracy. No cash supply at ATM points over scarcity of new notes. Um, we've seen some queues in some states around the country. Anxious customers beseech banks. Cautious banks hold on to old Naira notes. Some people are swearing that it may will extend that deadline. Uh, tribute says Abia PDP governorship candidate uh, Ikone dies at 66. Really sad one. Those plotting to deal with me won't win elections, says Wike. He's back on front pages. Those plotting to deal with me won't win elections, says Wike. Uh, Abdul Razak signs 188.8 Naira budget. I think that should be billion Naira. And uh, Messi rejects new PSG contract. Who knows if he wants to go enjoy some Arab money with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Those are the, the headlines on the front page of The Nation. Away from The Nation newspaper, uh, we have the leadership. The leadership says, Naira redesign feels scarcity targeted at me. I mean, uh, that's what the presidential candidate of uh, the uh, All Progressive Congress is quoted to say, but some people say, I mean, that's too much. Nigeria, uh, it's, it's bigger than an individual, and that's usually what uh, people will say. It's not all about you, really. You know, uh, says plans to squatter 2023 elections will fail. Uh, blackmail won't save you, uh, the PDP is saying, tells uh, Shiwaju. PMB's support for APC flag bearer unquestionable. President is quoted to say, the writers you find there. There's also another head there this morning. Ikona's death, Abia PDP heads for fresh primaries. Uh, quite unfortunate one right there. And NJC clears 84 judges, nine heads of court for appointment. Aviation workers strike won't happen again. The federal government is saying, well, how can we understand this? Because that's a private business. The government is saying all of that. What can the government do that all of this doesn't happen? Uh, questions that you are begging for answers. Nigeria, Egypt agree on joint electricity development. 
God won't allow my enemies win presidency. And the governor of River State, Yasam Wike, is also on that one. All right. Interesting uh, headlines. Mercy here. I can't wait to get a uh, uh, guest's thoughts on that. Let's move over to the final paper on our table tonight, or this morning, rather. Hey, uh, Daily Trust. 38 herders killed in Nasarwa air raid. 38 herders killed in Nasarwa air raid. Uh, 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 it's a sad story, really sad. Another one to make us really sad. Uh, the writers to that are innocent members were killed by uh, Air Force, Magban. Okay, uh, I'm sure you know what Magban uh, refers to, uh, Mieti Ala Katub Breeders Association of Nigeria. Uh, innocent members were killed by Air Force. Drone used for shelling of pastoralists, Governor Sule, it's worst uh, of evil or it is worst evil of profiling northern elders as shows investigation military mum ah, here we go again tenable fuel crisis nara redesign ploy to sabotage elections we won't accept postponement pro bashiwaju pdp presidency cb apc cbn mum more from the daily trust bandits reject 5.3 million old naira notes in Kaduna, that should be 5.3 million naira uh, in all naira notes in Kaduna, say deadline approaching. Yeah. Um, even the bandits want to comply with the BFLA's directive. Uh, use vehicle, vehicles import crashes 40% with customs valuation scheme. Uh, some of the headlines on the front page. We'll bring in um, architect Ezekiel Yaitok at this time. Um, good morning to you, Ezekiel Yaitok. Thank you very much. Um, Let's start with this, this very sad one. And it's not the first time we hear in reports of um, collateral damage in the uh, fight against terrorism and insurgency uh, up north by the Nigerian Air Force. Last uh, time we had, I think in December, we also heard that some villagers uh, were killed. Um, almost the entire village came under the firepower of the Air Force. What are your thoughts on this? Well, this new development of headers, they are known, okay, and they belong to Makban. Will it lead to some sort of new insurgency or some sort of uh, 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 conflict? You know, I actually did take um, a very good look at that um, headline, um, the pictures and everything, and I, I really questioned myself um, the intention or the intentment of that article. I tried to look beyond the surface and, um, you know, there was an air raid, and unfortunately, there was collateral damage. But if you know how many people that have lost their lives on account of this insurgent, and we realized that the time had come when something desperate had to be done under the collateral damages, and, you know, the, the army seemed to have gone after these people with all vigor, and, um, you know, in the process... Um, to have highlighted this level of, um, sorry, the spelling of my Ezekiel, to have highlighted this level of um, collateral damage, I, I want to ask myself, what do we really want to achieve? Are we trying to say, look, you can't do this again, you should stop it? Are we doing that on account of our concern with the, the lives that have been lost that are very precious, I must admit, or is it a way to dampen the psyche of the, of the military and get them to stop doing what they are doing? Is somebody getting uncomfortable that the military is starting to get results? You know, the, the, the pictorials, the, the way the, the story is really blown, you know, uh, really loud. Uh, I'm concerned. I'm looking. I think that um, we all know that there will be collateral damage. We all pray that these damages should be should be, should be, you know, um, limited. We all believe that every Nigerian should, as much as possible, cooperate with the army. If there are areas that you know that insurgents operate and that they are going to be likely attacked, I think it behoves all women and men of goodwill in this country to isolate those areas, find a way of cooperating with the military. Let's isolate this. Would have been killing our people in numbers. So, 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 uh, is it clear? Are you saying that um, um, you know this story is being blown out of proportion, 
Um, I, uh, maybe I, I tend to I tend to see something a little deeper. I, mm. I may be wrong, mm. but I tend to think the, that the effort yeah. it might be a very tactical. Um, I may be wrong. You know, a effort to kind of dampen the morale of the people. But but but, what but, 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 but uh, architect, you have a uh, last month, I believe, um, uh, an, almost an entire village. You know, a lot of, of villages were wiped out in the bid to, to kill these insurgents. Um, these are innocent people. These are people's mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children. And, um, and they just get war. killed. Okay, so but the background, the background to this story, yeah. sorry, sir, is that they, yeah. they went to retrieve cattle, about 1,000 cattle that were seized from their members. And this is a labor union, if you want to call it that, Magban. They went to retrieve uh, over 1,000 cattle, or cattle, uh, cows, sorry. Uh, seized Cuts. from their uh, members by, by uh, uh, the Benway State Livestock Guards. And when they went to see the Benway State Livestock Guards, they said, please, give us our, our cows we'll play, or our cattle. We'll pay the fine. They were billed 29 million naira, 29 million naira. They paid the 29 million naira, and, and uh, some of the livestock you know, was released to the herders by the guards. Now, when they were offloading the cattle, shortly after they reached their destination in Nasara State, which happens to be Doma, uh, Rukubi community in Doma local government area, um, they were bombed. They were bombed and, uh, and killed. Is what uh, the, the paper is saying. Um, so we're hearing that the killing of these headers has raised tension in Benue State and Nasara State. You know how it can be. Um, and you can see the picture of, of the, the, the Muslims, you know, uh, the Islamic rights. And their bodies are there. These people are martyrs now. And maybe a cause for some people to say we want to revenge against the Nigerian state. Yeah, you are not you are not you are not following my narrative. I understand all that story, and every life matters as far as I'm concerned. And I feel bad that one Nigerian, not to talk of two, three, four, and the numbers that I've seen. I feel bad and my, my condolences to the family of these people. But I want to tell you that we are in a war situation. Look at what's going on in um, places like um, what's, a, what's, what's this place that's getting ravaged right now, you know, by, by, by Russia, you know. Ukraine. But the issue is, sorry? Ukraine. Ukraine, thank you. But the issue is this. There will be collateral damage. We are in a, situ a war situation. Such would come either by way of mistake, and the military has made mistake before, or a conscious, deliberate, intentional action. Now, when you look at the story behind, I don't think that they will attribute it to intentional, deliberate action, because it is not the government of Benue State that undertook the operation, but the army of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So I'm trying to look at the nexus. You know, what you've brought out is not how the government of Benue State did what is wrong. What you've brought out is how the army of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has killed innocent souls. And as a result, you are doing a reprisal against who? You know, I think we really need to look beyond stories and look at intentions and look at possible consequences of our, our actions. I, I believe that the military need to be a lot more careful in the past they've made mistakes of bombing, you know, non-military or non-war zones, you know, um, maybe they are... Ezek and I mean, just before, yeah. you know, quickly, I, I move on to another subject on this, but I'd like to add, it's unfortunate that we don't have this, you know, dominating all of the headlines. I mean, one would think that you wake up this morning and that's what, uh, that's the story that's making it. Because if you look at it, apart from the fact that uh, uh, you have this other paper saying 38 headers, we're talking about 100 civilians who've been killed. That's the story. 100 civilians have been bombed mistakenly by, you know, the Nigerian Air Force. And the, the, the next question would be, uh, this has become a pattern. So if you have a repeated pattern, do you now call that a mistake? Because, I mean, if you look at data up on from, you know, 2014 to about this time, there's been several mistaken, I mean, uh, what was it called again? Uh, bombing mistakes. That's what we've had. Uh, you want to look at from 2017, you want to go on uh, several communities and we keep saying yeah. that, oh, this mistakes and over. So it's Dude, a that, recurring that, that pattern. And, and I'm Thank asking, you. is this really a mistake? And how come, you Thank know, we've you. not had this as a major headlines on the papers this morning? So I think the narrative now is that of 
the military not being precise in their operations. That's the narrative. And that narrative is not acceptable. We have to tell the, uh, the military as much as we want to you know, encourage you, we want to boost your morale, we want to appreciate what you are doing, we want to know that it's a difficult thing, but please, you cannot continue making these mistakes. And if that is something you have no control over, then you probably have to change the strategy. It has to be a national narrative and not brought down to a specific thing. So I agree with you that the military needs to be a lot more precise. If they cannot use maybe the Tucano jet or they need more trainings, then we may need to bring experts who will do the plotting and, you know, the execution while our people continue to do the learning until they are sure. Because you need to plot and get very decisive, definite targets. And these are not things that you rush. It has to be the intel that you have followed over a long period of time. And establish. look at what happened to uh, Saddam Hussein. It wasn't just uh, something random. You know, they, they, they followed it until they got specific intel, and then boom, they zeroed in on it. The military has to be that precise, and it has to be intel-based. So to that extent, I continue to, you know, say my heart reach out, reaches out to the families that have been lost, both in this last incident and in the past incidents. So I, I bet, let the narrative be that the military needs to be sharper, and not that, um, you know, what, what I'm saying today, which... I hope I'm wrong. All right. We, we look at the nation newspaper now. Uh, the big one there, of course, a um, lot of reaction on social media <laughs> to this story. Um, the presidential candidate of the APC, Upper Grace Congress, Ashwa uh, Jibola Tinubu, uh, uh, alleging that fifth columnist, uh, fifth columnist uh, behind the petrol scarcity and the Naira redesign row. Um, the paper says, the nation newspaper, that is, says that uh, the flag bearer of the APC yesterday reflected on the fuel scarcity and the Naira redesign uh, crisis, which have attracted, uh, the paper says, a condemnation by many Nigerians. It says, uh, the, the paper says he said the petroleum scarcity and complaints about currency uh, redesign were plots by unpatriotic elements and saboteurs to embarrass the Buhari administration and scuttle uh, the proposed elections. Um, he also said the APC, in the paper says the APC candidate who said the tricks will collapse, uh, fired salvos at the opposition PDP. Um, so he had Nigerians to anticipate the election, uh, electoral revolution of on February 25. Uh, I'm sure he's talking about when he, 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 he will expect to win the elections. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, the very thing that just comes to my mind is that I honestly can't understand what is going on between the so-called two big parties. Now, if you read be between the lines... The, 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 the APC candidate is directly castigating his party. And as a matter of fact, he's telling us that his party is either incompetent to handle the affairs of state or that they are those directly behind. Because I don't want to see a situation where at a time like this, when the party is going for election, they will keep quiet and watch somebody sabotage them. And what are you talking about? We're not talking of maybe some terrorist or some militant striking here and there. We are talking of major government policies. How can you talk of fifth columnists on policies? The redesign of the Naira note is not a coincidence, it's not an accident, it's not people hoarding money that you cannot see. It is a policy, a deliberate, intentional policy of the government of APC. The fuel scarcity is not a group of people, you know, trying to make life difficult. It is something that the NNPC, controlled by the government, has control over the supply of petrol to the country. So you are telling me that your government is sabotaging you. The question is, to what end? What do you really want to achieve? Should this actually be a public discourse or should it have been an internal affairs that the party will hold a very serious um, meeting and, you know, table these things and say, Mr. President, I really want to know where are we going? Do you support me? Do you not support me? Do I run lonely or do I count? Where are we? Party, where are we? Because, you know, election, I'm standing election. An election is, is, is not just one leg. There's a candidate, there's the party. 
And in this case, there's the system, which is the government, because in some places, you may have the party, you have the candidate, and then they have no control over the government. But where there's a party, there's a candidate, there is the government, the issue is what is the tripartite relationship between the three of them. And something tells me that something is fundamentally wrong within the camp of the APC. And um, I don't know where the problem came from. There are all manner of, um, you know, uh, speculations and fifth columnists and, um, you know, you know, there's many, many, many things that um, people bring up. And um, we are asking ourselves, was he a preferred candidate in any way? Did he bulldoze his way? Has he stepped on toes? There is definitely something wrong internally. Something really, really wrong. And um, I think they need to find a more creative way of bringing out that um, because before conspiracy theory starts to nail what um, I tend to think is happening. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it was very unfair for himself to bring up the issue of um, Castro. You know how they've called him Mr. Bullion Van? So you wanted to, if I were his strategic advisor, I would have let him have the impression that, oh, no, no, this doesn't bother me. All the things have been said. So all that bullion van thing you were talking about is absolute nonsense because we are executing this um, um, policy, this election with our strategy. We are going to win. Then inside house, you can be saying, oh, guys, what's happening? But when you come outside and say, ah, cash um, exchange is causing problems, is it that you still have a large stack of notes, old notes that you have not brought out. If you have not brought it out, why? where are you keeping it? And why are you keeping it there? Are you a patriotic Nigerian? Should that be the proper thing to do? Questions and questions, and they need to be careful the remarks they make because it's going to raise a lot more questions. Ezekiel Yaitok, let's talk about, you know, the elections and the concerns that you have the United States uh, raising. Uh, Anthony Blinken has said that... Uh, um, you know, there will be some restrictions on those who are trying to undermine our democracy. And of course, uh, the punch says that parties back U.S. A visa ban on election riggers. Uh, specifically, uh, you have some parties saying, hey, we support this as a welcome development. But I'd like to ask you, do, do you think that, you know, in its real sense, that the United States is really... Uh, you know, in support of our democracy, not undermining it, that they are committed to this is not just on paper. I'll tell you something. I've, I've traveled so almost uncountable number of times to the United States of America. And I will tell you that at the highest level of the governmental operations, Nigeria is a major, you know, focus on their policies. Nigeria has the largest enlightened immigrant settlement in the United States, in the whole world, Nigerians. Aside from that, the population of Nigeria in Africa, which is the next frontier, is not such that you can dismiss with a wave of the hand. If anything goes wrong in Nigeria, God forbid, it will affect the economy of America directly, directly, not indirectly. The number of people that will be seeking asylum from Nigeria, the whole of the West African subregion is going to get unsettled and is going to affect the rest of the world. So whatever goes on, the peace and stability of Nigeria is important to the international community. Now, what I would tell you is that they may not want the sort of peace that leads to progress because the progress of Nigeria, in my opinion, is a threat to the international communities to a large extent. That is why each time we are doing leadership recruitment, you really don't see them lining behind. Look at all the young people that we are having. Look at all the, you know, the, if you listen to certain candidates, whether it is that of um, ADC or that of SDP or other young, they are young, vibrant people that... If the American government wanted to give them strategic support for them to come up and give Nigeria focused leadership, they know what to do. I tell you this with every sense of responsibility. Even a state like Akwaibom State, which is extremely important, you know, to the economy of Nigeria, 
not to talk of the global. They will but, do but, everything. But, 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 but Ezekiel, I mean, you, you said that, you know, if you look at the policy and that's what it is, Nigeria has a stake and what have you. But uh, this is not the first time I'm hearing this statement from the United States. And we're asking how many persons have been banned, how many visas have been restricted of these persons. I mean, public, especially where we're in an era where the social media is there. And of course, they, they also uh, have the observance every other time monitoring the election. So you can't tell me. Is this not just another lip service, uh, you know, trying to be the big brother of the world? You know, there's the way things work. I always say, say it. I always say it. Mine is say it. Because there's something in the Bible that I believe. The Bible says that a man is ensnared by the words of his mouth. Say it first. You understand me? It, it's something that goes beyond the natural. Say it first. Because it's easier to activate what has been instigated than for you to start from the beginning what has never been pronounced. So for me, say it. And you know, times and seasons come. You know, it's like the politics in Nigeria. You know, it's not going to be, not going to be, and all of a sudden you discover that it happens. So just say it. For me, I'm happy that they are saying it because it will be easier to activate what they have said. So I really don't have any problem. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, we need leaders who understand world politics. When we have leaders that understand world politics, they will know what extent to go with what Americans say or the British say. They will know that our success is a threat of some sort to them. They will know that we cannot live our lives in their hands. They will know that they need us as much as we need them, but that they are not going to make us as good, not to talk about being better than they are. That they are that's why when we go to China and try to see China helping us, borrowing us, we need to know that there are lines that the Chinese will not cross. They think of themselves first, just like we say Nigeria first. Americans are America first. So there's an extent to which somebody is going to help you. You've got to know that as a leader and know how to play the game. We have people who are in positions of leadership who don't understand global politics, global leadership, you know, strategies and dynamics. You've got to know these things so that when you go to somebody, you know that that guy is not going to love you more than himself. So you've got to know where to draw lines and not to think that, oh, you can leave your hands in the hands of another person. Lie. All right, Ezekiel, thank you very much. Let's look at the, uh, another story, a very interesting one, on the front page of leadership. Um, I mean, these days, it seems that Egypt has become a reference point uh, uh, in Nigerian political discussions, so in discussions surrounding electricity uh, or power supply in, in Nigeria. We will always look at Egypt. Uh, I, I think it's became more popular or popularized by a particular presidential candidate, if I'm not mistaken. But the paper, yeah. uh, the leadership is... Um, telling us on its front page, uh, Nigeria Egypt agree on joint electricity development. It says that um, both countries signed uh, uh, an MOU to enhance bilateral cooperation in the field of electricity and renewable energy. The Egyptian Minister of Electricity, you have a Minister of Electricity, uh, Mohamed Shakar and his Nigerian counterpart, Abubakar uh, uh, Liu, signed the document um, according to a statement by the Egyptian Ministry on the 24th of January. Um, so he's a Minister of State for Works and Housing. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, two things. Um, you know, we get people who get into power without really knowing the essence of seeking public office outside of state capture. One of the most basic, most fundamental, most problematic issues that we've had to deal with as a country is the issue of power. You come into government. The very first thing you do is do two strategic studies. First is your peculiar situation, and the second is best corporate practice or global practice. Those two things. When you've studied your peculiar situation, your needs, your limitations, and then you study the best global practice, you marry the two and see what you can take from it to be able to solve your problem. Now it takes you seven and a half years to know a country not far from you that is getting the power problem right. It now takes a presidential candidate to go and study that, to now bring up a new ideas on what is possible, and now you are at the twilight of your exit 
trying to forge an agreement and understanding after seven and a half years. No, not even seven and a half. Seven and a half plus 19. Because during, if you want to get into power, you don't wait till you get into power. Like now, I can tell you a lot of things about a quiet bomb state because before getting into power, I'm doing a lot of strategic study from 1999 and beyond. So I have, you know, perspective, knowledge, and then you now get into power where you can situate things so that the things you thought were are not really seven and a half years after, some weeks, so to speak, to your exiting power, you now realize, oh, there's Egypt that is doing right and we can copy from them. I think they should just quietly leave all these things and let us have good election, good transition, and let the people that come in start. All these new things that the new jet things that, uh, oh, we were the one that started this before we left office. All those is um, bald and ash. It doesn't get to me. I actually get very infuriated by some of these things. Please forget new projects. Forget new anything. Do what they call finishing strong. That's what you should be doing now. Go and do a profiling of all your events, your activities, and then group them into A, B, C. A is the one you must complete no matter what happens. B is the one that is necessary. You do everything. C is where you say you cut your losses. Leave them out. You have just weeks to go. So don't be thinking, thinking of new things. You don't even have enough time for you to consolidate on your A's. And then you are now going to B and then C, starting something new. In fact, D, because that's like a new engagement. I know government is a continuum, but I think that wisdom is profitable to direct, like the Bible says. All right. Go and how it can finish strong. That should be the policy of this administration as of today. All right. Just to make a correction, then, of course, Minister of State for Works and Housing, um, uh, he actually was appointed in 2021, Aboraka Adialiu, uh, as Minister of uh, Power, um, September 2021, by President Mohamed Buhari. Well, um, just uh, in a minute or less than a minute, uh, let's share your thoughts on this one. It's on the punch as well. He talks about banks ration new notes. Emefili Sean's rep, uh, reps, uh, by the way, I mean, there's several quarters. A lot of persons anticipated that, you know, there will be an extension as to the swapping of the notes, uh, the new Naira with the old Naira. But uh, uh, listening to the CBN governor, he said he had no good news for uh, you know, those persons who are anticipating, and it is what it is. Uh, how do you react to this headline? The very first thing is that I go to banking hall and the note counting areas, and they are empty. What? I don't, I don't understand what is going on. The only thing I can arrive at is that there are people that have these tons and tons of money they cannot afford to bring out. There's been enough time. And let me tell Nigerians that there will be no extension. If any extension will be done, it will be far after the election. But you see, for this election, all the people that have put money to buy votes, they don't enter voicemail. It's not going to, not going to work. MFLA is not going to change. The best it can do is to say, okay, I extend by another one week. Quote me and quote me well. But to say that they will leave that indefinitely and you use old notes to go and do election is not going to happen. I can tell you that we know without, without batting an eyelid. So for me, the banking halls are still empty. The note counting rooms are empty and you are complaining. I can understand that of PVC collection where you go, you can see long queues. Please tell me your reason for wanting an extension. Go to any bank, go to the bank counting rooms, you discover that I've, I've, done, I've done that myself. So the question is, who, who has a problem? And why does the person have a problem? They go answer that question, you know, they will answer. All those that have money in their soak away, that money is going to soak away. That's what's going to happen to that money. All right. but, because but, thank you, Ezekiel. We, we, we have to go. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a thrill having you and um, hopefully... Uh, hoping to have you again uh, next time. Appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God bless the two of you. You too. You too. You too. Well, that's the size of it on Off the Press. We take a break. When we return, we'll be looking at our first major conversation and uh, the issue of local government autonomy again is back on our table for a conversation. At this point, 
is not a positive uh, because you have state houses of assembly rejecting that particular bill, seeking autonomy for local government. Please stay with us.